Assalamu alaikum. Welcome everybody to the Science Connections show that is broadcasted by the Muslim TV network. This is a show that is going to help us explore nature through science to discover the wonderful world around us from quarks to galaxies and everything in between. Our innate curiosity will guide us asking critical questions and more critical questions uh, that lead us on a journey of trial and error and maybe more uh, failures than successes, but ultimately to create a world that is in harmony with the universe around us. In each episode, we will meet with a scientist and we'll ask her to share with us her scientific discoveries and tell us about her journey uh, of, of into science uh, and how she uh, embarked on her roller coaster journey of discovery, failing, succeeding, and everything in between. And then lastly, she will share with us how her discoveries have had an impact on our everyday lives in ways we have never imagined. Today, our guest is Professor Shadia Rafai Habbad. She's a professor at the uh, University of Hawaii at the Institute of Astronomy. We are so excited to have you with us, Professor uh, Shadia. Uh, welcome to the show. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I'd like to start by sharing uh, uh, the science I do because it's not uh, uh, something that people do on a regular day basis. Uh, so this is uh, my, the basis of my work has to do with uh, the sun and in particular the outer atmosphere of the sun that we call the solar corona. Corona is basically the halo of the sun. Now. On a, on a regular day, you can't really, if you look at the sun, you will damage your eyes. But if you wear special uh, glasses, then you can see an orange disc, and but you can't see anything beyond it. But when you have what we call a total solar eclipse, uh, which is uh, slide three, then um, what happens is the, the moon comes and blocks the sun. And then uh, it blocks this very bright disk and you see, you can see just an incredible, beautiful uh, uh, halo around the sun that we call the solar corona. Now, the, the, uh, it was, we, we have to go back a little bit in time to appreciate why we are interested in the solar corona. So for a long time, manifestations of the fact of there is a stream of particles that leave the sun and uh, fill the interplanetary space uh, came from uh, uh, seeing, visually seeing uh, the aurora borealis, which you can see in uh, the high latitudes, either the high northern lati uh, con countries or the southern, let's say, go south of uh, uh, Chile, Argentina and Antarctica. You see this gorgeous display of colors at night, which is called the Aurora Borealis. Now, for a long time, uh, people tried to figure out where this light came from. The other manifestation of the solar corona, of the stream of particles from the sun, comes through uh, observations of comets, which are not as frequent as the aurorae, but uh, they appear in the sky and they have these beautiful tails. Now, they they have usually, they should have two tails. One is brighter than the other. And one of them is, is the fainter one is always pointed away from the sun. So these two uh, phenomena have uh, after, uh, I mean, and the observations of the corona, scientists started to try to make a connection between what, how the sun's atmosphere, whether it stays stuck to the sun or does it expand into interplanetary space. So by 1958, uh, uh, Professor Parker, who's at the University of Chicago, came up with the idea that uh, the gas pressure in the atmosphere of the sun can't hold it back, but it has to expand. Now, I must uh, mention that the critical idea of the fact that the this, well, we know the surface of the sun is at 6,000 degrees, but once you go into the corona, the temperature goes up to several million. And that's a big dilemma because we don't know how can a, a gas start from a low temperature and then increase to a very high temperature without any assistance from some kind of a, 
an energy source. And the fact that the corona is hot was discovered from total solar eclipse observations. And those were um, made with the, with the invention of a spectrometer, uh, the scientist, which is an instrument that analyzes the different colors of the light. And uh, they associated the different colors with elements you see on the ground. So if I can have uh, the fourth slide, please. Uh, so the picture of the corona, this is a, an image that is close to what an eye can see. But before uh, seeing this, uh, just by looking at this picture alone, you really don't know anything about the composition of the gas in the corona. You don't know anything about its temperature. So if I can have the, the fifth slide, please, uh, then this is not the, the uh, necessarily, it's a color, uh, it's an art, art yes, this one. It's a, uh, the, the previous one, please. It's an artificially colored uh, 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 picture, but what it has is it's seeing the light from the corona in two different, from light that's coming from two different, the same element, iron, which has lost uh, different numbers of electrons. So a, a neutral atom has so many, uh, for example, for iron, it has 26 electrons. And in this case, uh, when we talk about iron 11, that's iron that has lost 10 electrons. And iron 14, which is shown in green, has lost uh, 13 electrons. So for an ion like mm -hmm. iron to lose so many electrons, you have to have a temperature that's over a million degrees. So that was a, a really fundamental discovery that was made during a total solar eclipse. So following this discovery, is when uh, Parker came up with this theory that, you know, all this, this, uh, these structures, these features you're seeing in the corona, are a, a demonstrate, uh, are a, um, a visual representation of how the gas is streaming from the sun into interplanetary space. So then you would ask yourself, well, why does it have these very fine filaments? What do they mean? Well, now we know that the, these filaments are really the a reflection of the magnetic fields or the magnetism that's produced at uh, below the surface of the sun and it it uh, surfaces above the surface and has these uh, takes on these different shapes so um, so my research has been uh, observing the corona during total solar eclipses and i started in 1995 now you would these uh, events happen all over the world uh, at a frequency of about once every 12 months to 18 months. The duration is only a few minutes, uh, six at most. And you have to be in a, in a, like a shadow band on the earth to be able to see the corona. And that was shown in the first slide. Uh, so, once you are in this band, this is when all of a sudden the moon starts to cover uh, the sun. And when the moon fully covers the sun, then you will see the corona. So my research has been going on, that direction has been going on for quite some time. And uh, after having, uh, we test new technology, new ideas. So each eclipse brings us with new discoveries. And we have, uh, recently after having uh, like over 14 years of data of the same uh, same quality, we can now say something about the solar wind. So the stream of particles that leaves the sun and goes, invades or fills interplanetary space is called the solar wind. And that's the term that uh, Gene Parker had given to it. So at the, in 1960, at the beginning of the space age, uh, the first detection of the solar wind was made by a, a U.S. Uh, spacecraft and instrument. And what they detected is this continuous stream of particles going through their detectors. So since then, so the theory uh, predicted the why or came up with the ideas why the solar wind existed. And these interplanetary spacecraft uh, confirmed its existence. So what has my... Uh, 
so my contribution I, to to solar physics has been through these eclipse observations. So can I can I interrupt you and ask a question? Yes, of course. I mean, yes. we, we hear about solar eclipses all the time in the news, and now especially uh, everything's on the internet. We get these alerts that there's going to be a solar eclipse, uh, and and of course, in different parts of the world see it differently. Uh, and I, I don't think people realize how much information one can gather in those few minutes, and how important. It is. One thinks, oh, it's just a solar eclipse. And apparently there's a wealth of information there uh, that you're describing uh, and that, that really informs your research and allows you to, what I understood from you, to, uh, to deduce uh, information about the sun. Because we can't go to the sun itself and actually you know, do some testing unless you can tell us if that's possible. So it's all by inference and deduction using uh, these instruments and trying to understand what's happening uh, at the surface of the sun, which to me is fascinating. And just uh, as an indicator of how, you know, at being curious and asking questions and then reflecting on them and inferring is part of uh, the human brain and, and how we evolved to ask questions. So I, I couldn't resist to comment on that, but I'd love to know more about what is your contribution, what you have done uh, in adding to the information or to the body of science. Yes. So, so um as I said, I started in 95 and I just originally out of curiosity in the research I had been doing prior to that, we wanted to know what the temperature at the in the corona was where the solar wind was originating from. So we, we thought, OK, we will go on this eclipse expedition, take a camera and try to to image the, the sun in these, uh, as I said, these two colors. I'll just call them colors because it's easier for the audience. Now, the first time you do such an experiment, first of all, that this one was in India. It was 42 seconds long, not longer. And you, we trained to make sure we, we were get, gathering the data with the cameras as, uh, you know, without a glitch. Anyway, so the first images we got were, were fine, but it took us at least 10 years to develop all the, the knowledge and, and uh, to, to acquire a sense of how we would improve on, on our observations. So as I said, each eclipse gives you, brings you back with new ideas and you say, okay, I can improve on my camera, I can improve on the optics, etc. So the, the, I would say starting from 2006, that was the eclipse in Libya, that was really a, a major breakthrough in our uh, scientific knowledge of the corona. So these, uh, these colors had been observed for decades by many people, but nobody realized why they were so important for the science of the sun, of the corona. And the reason they're important is because from these observations, you can tell something about the temperature, the density of the gas. You can say something about the constituents, uh, like, you know, we, we know we have iron, but there's also carbon, oxygen, you name it. All the elements are in the corona and they produce different colors or uh, parts of what we call the spectrum. So, um, but I'll stick to colors, just like in the rainbow, you have different colors. Now, the, the, uh, the other discovery that people have made about the corona from observing in space. Now, space uh, to, to go to space and also to observe the sun in a way similar to a, an eclipse, you have to produce a, like a, a, like a man-made uh, mood. So you place a small uh, uh, like little disc in front of your optics. Uh, it's much more intricate than what I'm saying. And then you block the, the disk of the sun and you can see the corona. Now from space, the sky is dimmed enough that you can see much further away. But this blocker, with the blocker, you can go so close to the sun. So in, uh, for example, the picture uh, number six, I show a comparison between an eclipse image and uh, an image that was taken from space at the same time. And in, you can see that the, the blocker, the white circle on, on the right image, is empty. So you really don't know how to connect what you're seeing in the corona back to the sun. On the left, you have the, the uh, Im eclipse image, which shows you the, the expansion of the structure starting from the solar surface out to several uh, radii. And 
you will notice in this particular example that there's a strange bubble right almost south at the bottom of the picture. And this is what we call a coronal mass ejection. So these were discovered uh, in, from ground-based coronavirus, but it was difficult to realize what they were seeing. But from the space, you see them all the time. So from space, since you're taking continuous observations, you see the stream of particles that are just keep, you know, expanding from the sun. And then all of a sudden, once in a while, you see this bubble that's growing and growing and then just going out from the sun. And now we know that these huge bubbles can interact with the Earth's magnetic environment and they can cause disruptions. If they're very, very powerful, they can cause disruptions of the uh, uh, satellites. They can short circuit uh, the, the grids. So in a way, this understanding the, the origin of these coronal mass ejections and how they're originating from the sun is a critical piece of information that is really impacting our livelihood since we now depend so much on telecommunication. Oh, so, oh, so, 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 so yeah, this yeah, is very, this is very interesting. interesting. Uh, uh, First of all, the patience, patience that your patience. research requires to wait from event to event and over the years to, you know, to develop better optics, to take better pictures. And then the traveling, I mean, so you've been all over the world and probably in the most uh, unexpected places. You mentioned Libya, you mentioned India. So uh, you, you could share some more about that. That in itself must be an adventure. And, yes, uh, I think yeah. it's, as I said, it's an unusual uh, uh, research direction, but uh, it does, it has this uh, fantastic hu human aspect to it that's very, uh, very unique. So we do have to travel to different parts of the world because if you look, there are um, people who have made maps of where these bands, shadow bands, where they cover the earth. And you'll see they crisscross the earth in, in ways that look like random. So we went, uh, for example, the furthest north we went was to the island of Svalbard, uh, beyond the Arctic Circle. And this was in 2015. Um, the, we went to southern Chile and Argentina in 20, uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, the, the, we also went to Kenya. Uh, we went to South America. We went to Zambia. So we were in Zambia. We were in the middle of a, uh, of a nat national forest. And I had picked uh, the site because I knew this was where the path of totality was going through. And through some connections and so on. Um, they, we, we managed to get a driver with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with food and so on and to set up a camping site. And I didn't realize at the time that we were next to a lake that was full of hippopotamus. And I didn't know how dangerous these animals were. Uh, we were literally in the wilderness. And fortunately, nobody got hurt. The hippos didn't come close to us. But this was, uh, in a way, it was maybe a good thing that I was oblivious to the dangers because if you, once you are, then you kind of, uh, uh, you're, uh, you're always on edge and you can't really relax. So when we went actually to Svalbard, th there were polar bears and I was just terrified at the time that we might run into one of them. But uh, the, the, the country is very well, uh, they train people who come, you can't be in the field without having a few people in your group who train to, uh, to target shoot and you have a flare gun. So they tell you, okay, the first thing, if you see a polar bear, you, you uh, trigger the flare gun to scare them. If they don't, then you have to aim for the, uh, for the, the chest. <laughs> so, oh, the skull is so thick that you can't get anything. But I mean, uh, study... unfortunately, we didn't come across any polar bears. <laughs> That's great. So you study the universe, right? And the sun outside of Earth, yet this requires you to actually go to places uh, that like really wildlife places that so nobody I wouldn't have ever imagined that a career in astronomy would lead me to go to be a, like a, a, a you're kind of like a biologist going into uh, meeting and encountering all these different animals uh, in your journey I think I mean how that how much does that ground you in reality right when you're trying yeah. to see what's out there yet you have to deal with a bear or a hippopotamus in your back backyard of your camp yeah 
Yeah, this is the, the beauty of this research. Uh, as I said, there's a human aspect to it that's kind of uh, cannot be valued with any, you know, it's it just leaves uh, tremendous memories with you. And also the people, you know, every country we, we go to, we interact with the local community. And then you see, uh, you get to see the fabric of humanity that's so common across the world. You know, people are the same. You have the same kindness. You have the same... Uh, the 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 little kids who just run around us who just want to see what we have to offer, and uh, for me, uh, Libya was a special uh, expedition because uh, it, it was uh, to go from you know from to land in Tripoli and end up in the southern part of the country, which is an absolutely gorgeous desert, and at the time. Uh, uh, the uh, the Libyan government made it possible. They they uh, provided all the transportation to the south, so it was really a memorable experience from the human point of view. But also scientifically, it was one of our first discoveries. Well, and as you encountered the local people in these different places around the world, I'm yeah. sure, especially the children, they were asking you about the science. They wanted to know more. So, do you have uh, any? Do you remember any encounter or some or what you? felt just talking to the kids, raising their awareness to science, explaining what you're just telling us now about about yeah. those the solar wind, the, the bubbles that you see uh, on the surface of the sun, and, and, so yeah, have, and how that inspired you to ask. Yeah. So I have uh, three memorable experiences. One was in 99, we went to the northern part of Syria, right at the border between Turkey and Iraq, very, very small area called Indy One. Diwar. And there were uh, these little small village and the children just came around and they wanted to see the equipment. And I think because I was a woman and from Syria, they they connected right away. So they uh, and I told I, I explained to them what they were going to see. We gave them these special glasses. But unfortunately, the parents decided it was too dangerous for them to be out during the eclipse and they put them all indoors. So they didn't see the corona. And I was heartbroken when I heard that after the eclipse. We were too busy. I couldn't really uh, be running the e equipment and also paying attention to, to the local community. On the other hand, when we went to uh, Tatakoto in, the, in French Polynesia, a very, very small atoll of 300 people, the headmaster, uh, I gave a, also a lecture to the kids, and the headmaster told me, so the tricky part is to know when to remove the glasses because as long as there's light coming from the disk of the sun you cannot you have to protect your eyes to look at the sun you won't see the corona but the moment the moon fully blocks the, blocks the sun then you see the corona so you have to remove the glasses so what uh, so he told me okay how do you know the time i say i know exactly the time i gave it to him he said okay i will ring the church bells <laughs> and it worked beautifully. All the kids got to see, uh, instead, uh, in addition to their parents and so on, got to see the eclipse. Because he was, he he was enlightened enough. He knew how to how to get them to listen. <laughs> it's a small community, so he rang the the, the bells. Yeah. In Indonesia, uh, they uh, we we had uh, in, uh, we were on an island, and there were not so many kids as, mu as much as young adults who were helping out with the cooking and so on. And we explained to them, we showed them the glasses and so on, and they were right next to us so we could lead them through the steps. And they were just totally fascinated, in awe, and uh, you know, they, they were just dumbfounded. So those are the, some of the neat experiences I had. Yeah, and I think yeah, I think you point, you point the importance, the importance of raising of awareness, awareness, awareness science, science mm -hmm. uh, among the general public, mm -hmm. so that so, so they can respect it, it, understand it, and work with it, and realize how important it is uh, for their livelihood in one way or another on the long run. Uh, and, and and these expeditions of yours, I'm sure they have an impact beyond time and space that you can imagine when these kids yeah. grow up and remember these encounters with you. Uh, yes. and how that piqued their curiosity. Yes, I wish I, I lost contact with them. And now, of course, with the civil war in Syria, I really don't know what happened to to all these young people. I mean, it's kind of sad, very sad. But uh, I'll get back to the, 
the science. So when I talk to young people, what I really encourage them is to 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 follow their dreams. You know, if there is something that drives you, you're curious about, don't let anybody tell you you shouldn't you shouldn't think about this or you shouldn't follow your dreams. You should have confidence in yourself and then just just go. So of course it's there's luck involved as far as having the opportunity to study to go to advance up to a certain degree in your in your um, in your uh, uh, education and so on. But I think no matter at which stage you stop, there's always something fascinating that science has to offer, either even if you are a teacher or I mean just to get the uh, the uh, the awe of science, the beauty of science, to share it with uh, the, your your students or even uh, you know adult students. Like when I teach at the university, in um, some of the courses, uh, I always try to fit in a lecture on the eclipses because it's so special and so fascinating and the students are just uh, just beyond themselves when they when they hear about it so in 27 uh, 2019 i managed to get uh, some undergrads we we had a grant from the national science foundation to take uh, students who came from an uh, underprivileged background, who didn't have the money, who were probably the first in their generation to go to college. So we took four with us to the eclipse in Chile and Argentina. So for them, it was a life uh, turning event. And they all ended up, uh, when they finished their undergraduate degree, they went on to a PhD program. Wow, that's so, amazing. So, yeah. So, so, I mean, so you're, you're inspiring me. I remember growing up, I was always interested in astronomy. And I think I was always torn between either studying biology or astronomy uh, because both fascinated me and each one uh, in its own level and, and its own dimension. But let's take a break and then yes. we'll come back so that we can learn more about how you became the scientist and what, what what's your life journey story. Okay. A free online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today. Dad, they took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Find her. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. silence to help a friend with their mental health at seizetheawkward.org. All right, welcome back. Uh, we have with us Professor Shadia Rafai Habbal, who is a professor at the University of Hawaii at the Institute of Astronomy. Uh, professor Shadia, please share with us your personal story. What got you into science? Uh, I mean, from your background, what's your story? Well, I think as a child, I was always interested in science. I, 
I remember the first time, well, I, looking at the sky from the window, from the bedroom, and thinking, this, this can't be the limit of where, of where we're living. There has to be something beyond this sky. So that was when I was very, very little. Now, when I, uh, and I was also fascinated by the story of uh, Madame Curie, who discovered radioactivity. And uh, so she was more or less my hero at the time growing up. And uh, I also had in, uh, in high school, a, just a fantastic physics teacher. She was dynamite. I mean, she would present the, the problem sets with the, with characters, you know, she made up these two characters who were rowing on the moon, and she would say, well, you know, how, how does gravity change uh, compared to Earth, and, and things like that. So by the time I finished uh, high school, I was determined to become a physicist. So I went to the University of Damascus, studied physics and uh, mathematics. We didn't have any astronomy at the time, no degree. And then afterwards, I went to the uh, American University of Beirut, and I also got a, I got a master's in physics, and then uh, uh, we applied to the University of Cincinnati in in the U.S. It was at the the beginning of the civil war in uh, Beirut, so we had to leave, and then we we got into uh, a program. I say we at the time I was uh, married, and uh, I got we got the two of us got into a program, a PhD program in physics. Now, the transition from the Middle East to the U.S. is very different from what you see in, in television. You know, it was a culture shock in many ways. I'm not saying bad or it's just was different. Um, and I think whoever has made that transition also knows what I mean. Uh, so it was the first years were very, very difficult. We had a two year old and it was I thought it was easy to find uh, babysitters, you know, childcare in the U.S. Well, it was far more difficult than the Middle East, which surprised me because I thought they would be geared to that. Um, so after after four years, so I studied also physics. I studied a process in physics that's now applicable, that's fundamental for uh, any object in, in astronomy. But at the time, I didn't know that. So I didn't get into solar physics or, um, you know, solar astronomy until I went as a postdoc to Boulder in Colorado. And there I worked with the two uh, researchers and they were phenomenal. And that this is where I, whatever my background was helpful or useful to do research in solar physics. So I was doing theoretical work most of the time until I uh, came across this idea, <clears throat> sorry, um, I was flipping through a, a magazine called Sky and Telescope, and I saw that this was the beginning of the digital cameras as we know them now, but at the time, it was a Nikon camera at the top, uh, like a, a single lens reflex camera, and at the same size as, at the bottom was a Kodak chip. So the whole camera was double the size of you know, the Nikons or Canon cameras. And I thought, well, this is fantastic. We can take these to an eclipse because they're light, you know, they you, you transport them easily. And this is how I started, just by <laughs> seeing this ad for a, for a, <laughs> one of the first digital cameras. Wow, and, and that shows to, uh, it's about being observant or like that famous saying, seeing what everybody sees, but thinking what no one has thought. Uh, yeah. You were at the right time, at the right place. You had the right frame of work in your mind, and it just clicked. And that's usually how discoveries happen. Yeah. Oh, exactly. that's amazing. Yeah. So uh, at the time, I had no experience whatsoever with eclipse expeditions or instrumentation or anything. So I was fortunate to, uh, to be introduced to an engineer who knew what he, we needed and who uh, prepared everything for me. And I've been working with him since then, since '95. Fortunately, he has agreed to he agreed to keep on working with me. He finds, uh, you know, the the adventure part of it and going to different countries uh, very rewarding, even though it's it's a hell of a lot of work getting ready for an expedition. I can imagine. Now you're also pointing more to... demanding because yeah. we 
we don't uh, we just we thought whenever we have the chance we have more than one observing site so that if uh, you can imagine a strip of uh, shadow across the US as it happened in 2017 so we had five different observing sites one you always want to maximize your chances against weather and clouds and then we could also we figured we could uh, cover the, the the time evolution of in, in the corona itself so we really lucked out in 2017 because all the sites had fine weather so we managed to catch actually a coronal mass ejection in the and how it changed as a function of time between the sites and how it actually changed the temperature in the corona so that was the first time anybody had uh, observed that well that's amazing so so tell us share with us in your journey did you i mean were there times where things didn't work and i'm sure there were and how did you deal with them how did you keep going what yes i mean uh, what there are several hurdles one is the funding if you don't get the money you can't go so i'm always trying to get funding i think uh, kenya was the most i mean my worst uh, experience with an eclipse expedition because we arrived and usually what we do is we take all the delicate equipment with us on the plane either on in backpacks or rollers and the bigger equipment we check and now with the and then after the airlines change the allowance of the size and weight of the baggage we have to ship uh, the, the stands and so on i think i have a picture um in uh, number slide number 11 that shows what the equipment looks like so we um, uh, so I have to arrange for uh, the shippers and you if you're going obviously to a foreign country it has to be a temporary import so in this case the shipper forgot to write the word temporary in the document so we arrive in Kenya and the guys tell me uh, uh, Oh, you have to pay us fourteen thousand dollars because um, uh, you're importing equipment. I said no, this is temporary import. So they said, well, sorry. I spent two days going from one office to another. This is in a middle of a country I know nothing about. And then finally, we found one person who was willing to release the equipment for three thousand dollars. And it just so happened that before leaving, I told Judd my colleague uh, engineer I said you know I'm thinking of taking three thousand dollars cash with me just in case wow. you know why it was three thousand and why just in case I have no idea so when he said three thousand Judd looked at me and his jaw dropped it. <laughs> this is how much money I had on me so anyway we managed to get the equipment out of customs and uh, and into the country and then we had to drive and the roads were just atrocious and then 20 minutes before totality, we had this huge cloud, like a, almost like a sandstorm coming barreling across. It covered the sun. And 20 minutes later, after the eclipse, everything cleared. So oh, it was, yeah. yeah, we didn't get anything. Oh my oh God. My God. If, you, if you have a little cloud standing in front of the sun, that's it, you're gone. No matter how small the cloud is, the moment it's blocking the sun, you can't uh, you can't see anything. Well, 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 right? well of the fifteen, I have uh, I have uh, sixteen. Six of them we lost. Uh, we didn't get any observations. But. So what keeps you going, uh, Shad? Yeah, the scientists. What, the what keeps you going? Because I know that this is the only way to get the type of science we're getting. I mean, there's this little uh, piece of space around the sun that nothing can reach it except if you're observing during an eclipse. And we're with the equipment we're using, we can observe not just to take a picture like in white light, but there's so much physics you get out of these observations. It's remarkable. And that's okay. what keeps doing well i mean yeah it's that it's that it's you know uh, what you can imagine what you know is going to come out of it that keeps you going and gives you that persistence well uh, i which... know and then we discover we discover mm -hmm. new things and then it keeps us going again yeah, so it, it's not just me i mean 
uh, last, uh, the latest was we went to Chile in 2020 in December. So this was during the pandemic. We, we got uh, uh, permission. I was originally planning to go to Argentina, but we never got, we waited till a week before it was, you know, we couldn't wait any longer. We had to cancel from Argentina to go to Chile. So that means everything I had planned had to be replanned. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and then obviously the country, they allowed us to come in. We had to take all the tests and people were telling me, you're taking a chance with this pandemic. I said, well, my uh, the students on my team were eager to go. They had prepared the instrumentation. I said, I'm not going to let them go on their own. Mm -hmm. So we went, fortunately, nobody got sick. Uh, my son asked me, he said, what's your contingency plan? I said, I don't have any. Because I honestly didn't know, what, how would you start? You know, if this person gets sick, the whole group is stuck. And you can't just keep on saying, if this, then that, if this, then that, because there are too many parameters. So I gave up and I said, we'll just deal with them if that something happens. So fortunately, nobody got sick, but the whole country was covered with clouds. So we didn't oh. see it. <laughs> oh my god well sorry but then there were two uh, amateur astronomers who were able to get into argentina and they took pictures of the corona and they sent them to my colleague uh, in the czech republic who does uh, who processes the images and they turned out there was a gorgeous coronal mass ejection covering all the one side of the sun you know this huge bubble intricate bubble so we got something out of it, but it was thanks to amateurs. So well, amateurs well, can well, do a lot. But yeah, so yeah. They do, the question about amateurs, yeah. um, um, they can do a lot. Do you recruit them? Make, make, uh, make, uh, no, they go on there and then they make their pictures available to us. But they don't take the color pictures. They only take what we call white light. So they don't have special filters. They don't have spectrometers, but there's still a lot that can be learned from those pictures. So can I ask a technical question? Um, yeah. did, can one take a picture like from a plane if it's high above the clouds or it can't because it's moving? Yeah, many people do, but you know, the plane is moving. You have to take very, very short exposures. And then you have three layers of glass in the windows. Mm -hmm. We tried it once and we prepared our equipment, but our uh, observing mode had uh, had made uh, had a mistake and we didn't get anything valuable i see wow that's interesting i mean many, just many amateurs will pay tens of thousands of dollars if when they have the money to go on a plane because you fly above the uh, clouds and then you can see the corona mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well that's amazing so so can you share with us uh, shadia how what is the impact however far removed um, of your research on our everyday life as humans. Okay, so Earth. if uh, what we found from the eclipse observations is that uh, what I call these coronal mass ejections, these big bubbles, uh, from space, they see them, they see these big bubbles maybe once a day or once every other day. So the frequency is kind of known from the time sequence they get. But what we have found from eclipse observations is that there's always a coronal mass ejection the corona but they could be fainter than what they observe from space but it's just because you have just the perfect observing conditions that you see them uh, that they're much more frequently than people knew so with our observations and understanding the physical conditions in the corona what we're hoping to do is try to find a way to predict when they're going to be launched because as I said earlier, when they are very, uh, they have, they, when they carry a lot of, uh, you know, kinetic energy and uh, uh, highly charged particles, energetic particles, then they can impact uh, the magnetic environment of the Earth and they can impact uh, the satellites, uh, which we depend on significantly these days. Wow, so our, we are so much connected, uh, not just on Earth, yes. but with the universe yes. around us and with our sun yes. the star. Exactly, exactly. So the solar wind uh, doesn't just impact Earth, it impacts all the planets, but the Earth is the one we, we're directly, from a pragmatic point of view, we're directly impacted. 
Wow, I mean, this is so fascinating. So, so my, my, what, what advice do you have for young, young, you know, girls and boys who are watching this show uh, about getting into science? Well, I, um, I would tell them science is fascinating. No matter what you do in science, there's so much room for discoveries, your imagination to take you very, very far, and really to appreciate the beauty of the universe, what it has to offer. And then also it gives you a lot of humility because you realize that no matter how much you discover, there's still, you know, it's nothing compared to what's left to be discovered. So it's an endless open space uh, that's, that's just waiting for people to, to explore it, whether it's in astronomy or any field of science. You know, I just happened to land in, in, in physics and astronomy, but it's as fascinating as in other fields. Wow. And, and your message, I mean, from what you shared with us about how your teacher inspired you at school, uh, so the importance of having a, a teacher, uh, and yes. I think the importance of, uh, uh, of getting uh, our, our people to becoming teachers, I mean, not just scientists, we need teachers yes. who can inspire uh, the young generation. And then you mentioned also, uh, uh, how your community, you felt where, where you were uh, in Syria, you had a community or, or let's say a, a family who could support you so you could pursue your dreams, which yes. you didn't find that kind of support in the U.S. So again, the role of parents and family to support... It's critical. It's really critical. I mean, I tell the students, and sometimes it comes later in their life if they weren't exposed to it earlier, like uh, when I told you the four students we t took to Chile and Argentina who came from backgrounds where the family didn't really care about science or education. But for them, they ended up getting into graduate school. So it was a fantastic, uh, you know, end product. Well, I mean, getting into graduate school doesn't mean necessarily you have to do research, but you can contribute so much uh, to to humanity, to as a lecturer, as a teacher, uh, wherever you end up working in. So I was very fortunate that I was born in a in a family where both parents valued education, um, and then also to be given the freedom to choose because it's not always the case. Sometimes, like for. Several months after I got my baccalaureate, my father wanted me to sign up for medicine. And I told him, no, I don't want to. And he waited till the last day I could register. <laughs> then I said, I am not changing. I want to do physics. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for insisting. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been you know, listening to your wonderful discoveries and helping the world. <laughs> that's an important message because Yes, medicine is important, engineering is important, but we also need basic scientists who come in with these, you know, inquisitive minds who see what everybody sees but thinks in a totally different way. Yeah, and I must add, I mean, I, you know, I think the diversity in every respect is essential, you know, whether it's uh, gender diversity, cultural diversity, whatever. I think this is how the world advances when you respect each other. So I think as a people look at my group, and if you were to look at our composition, the, we call our, I, I gave us the name, the solar wind Sherpas, because oh. we carry everything on our backs. We still do. Um, I have colleagues from uh, Europe, uh, you know, Germany, the UK, the Czech Republic, who, basically joined the team just because they heard of me, heard about the work, and they got interested. And they had the time to invest. And of course, in the US. So, and then people look at us. Uh, so sometimes they come here and we prepare and then we leave from the US. And they wonder, how is this team working so well? I think it's because we respect each other. We know, I don't have to tell anybody what to do. They everyone finds what's needed to be done and they just get it done. And I think the these leadership skills, they vary from one human to another, but I think women have uh, obviously different skills than men when it comes to interacting with people. And it's uh, so it's it only enriches the whole humanity 
when women are as engaged as men in, in scientific research, because they have a lot to offer that is different from men. Not Absolutely. Many, it's different, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's why I think, I mean, you said you were inspired by Marie Curie. I think you yourself, Shadia, uh, is, a, uh, is an inspiration for the young generation around the world. And and we need, you. we, no, you're welcome. We are inspired by you because you are with us today, right? So we have somebody who's living, who we can relate to, who we can email, who we can talk yeah. to, uh, who's a living example of how one can become a scientist and succeed. And especially not just for young people in, in, in the US, but even the young people all over the world from different backgrounds uh, to look up to you. So you need to write your book, Shadia. We need you to write yes, a book. I have to. <laughs> There's one book a reporter wrote about me. It's called Eclipse Chaser. It's oh. for young uh, well, children, but it's really for any age. She did a fantastic job. She came with us to the eclipse in the U.S. in 2017. She asked me if she could be with my team. And I said, well, you can't really interfere with the preparation. She said, no, we'll just sit there. She had a, a camera person with her, a photographer. And they just were watching, observing us. And then whoever was free and she would just go and talk to and then uh, she put together this book, which is, she did a fantastic job. It's not just the picture. She also got uh, the ideas about the science at a level that, uh, you know, can be um, understood by most people. So it's a, it's a children's book. Well, I would say age, I don't know, five to whatever, 19 <laughs> or even. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's the eclipse. But I would like, I need to write a book on the eclipse. Uh, yeah, so the book is called The Eclipse Chaser and talks about yes. you. Uh, yes. So let, we'll keep that in mind and showcase it on the show for others to be inspired and get it and read to their children or to themselves. But then maybe you need to write your own personal story, like your memoir. Yes, I have to. Yes, I have to. I'm waiting for a sabbatical to be able to just sit down and, and do it now that with, uh, you know, after what, since 95 and also, the value of the data we have acquired since 2006 is really very, very special. So well, I have to. You got me excited to sign on and maybe come on and be a, a graduate student again, or just to, you know accompany you on these trips and to learn more. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I would love to do that. It's never too late, right? So long as we are inspired and we have that curiosity that keeps us going. So one last question. Um, now that we know th that we have been able to go to Mars and we've created all these different equipment and instruments, I mean, do you uh, imagine or dream of going to Mars and, and, and taking those pictures from Mars? How would that be different? No, uh, it won't work from uh, Mars because uh, the uh, Mars doesn't have a moon that eclipses the sun. It just so happens that the Earth is very unique the size of the moon relative to, I mean, in uh, in angular extent, uh, and its distance from the Earth is such that you have this opportunity. And I often wondered how long it would have taken humanity to discover the solar corona had it not been for the moon. Wow. So usually when I end my lectures, I thank the moon. <laughs> That is amazing. I love that. Yeah, that's a what an angular, you know, it's like you put your finger in front of your face and you block something. Well, mm -hmm. the moon is the same. It's at a at the right distance. It has the same, the right size to block the sun. Without it, you couldn't you couldn't have seen the corona. And I don't know how long it would have taken people to discover the corona because it started obviously since even like 1400 BC, the um, uh, they would discover tablets in Ugarit that had signs that they knew that there was an eclipse coming. It's yes. fascinating. I mean, people yeah. observed it for not centuries, more <laughs> millennia, and they knew. And they were, at first they were frightened. I mean, in Syria, people were frightened, unfortunately, because I had gone to Syria the year before and tried to inform. You know, I went to the uh, Department of Education. I talked to people, to the university. I told them all about it. And then, unfortunately, they didn't. They, did, they didn't listen to what I had to say. They everybody went indoors. They were terrified that some strange rays were going to 
attack them from mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so it was a shame you know when uh, people don't uh, grasp the full impact of the, the scientific value you know and then you get misinformation it's the worst yeah, ignorance is, 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 is a problem, and, and that's why science communication is so important. And having yes. scientists like you sharing your story to the general public, yes. um, explaining the science in, in, in a very simple way, uh, mm -hmm. is so important uh, yes. for the future of humanity. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. So I feel very fortunate to have landed uh, in science, to have had the fortune, the good fortune to follow the, this career. So it takes it takes perseverance and it takes luck, but you have to believe in yourself too. Yeah, absolutely. You can't be wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, this has been fascinating, and we have learned so much. We've learned about solar eclipses and their uh, how important they are. We've learned about your story and and, and your journey uh, of discovery, uh, and and all of the failures and triumphs of that. Uh, and and we hope that some of our listeners will follow you in your footsteps. Maybe you'll get an email. People will connect with you to want to come and help you. When's the next eclipse and where will it be the best to watch it? Well, in December of this year, it's in Antarctica. Oh, wow. Are you going so there? So we're trying to get... Uh, so unfortunately, it doesn't go over any of the stations, international stations. It goes over a part that has nothing. So we're going to, but it goes over the ocean, uh, just south of uh, Chile and Argentina. So we're we're trying to get on a on the deck of, to observe from the deck of a ship, uh, but that's taking. We're looking into how to stabilize our equipment because you have the motion of the vessel. So that's what we're doing at the same time as waiting for funding <laughs> to come in. So if there are any donors out there and they want to support us. <laughs> We would love to have donations for our eclipse expeditions, and they can join the group too. Uh, that's that's great. That's a, a great way to to uh, to. I don't want to say end the show, uh, for to take a break no. for the future. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and then the next one is in. Uh, it goes only over very very short land mass on Western Australia, mm -hmm. but 2024 goes through the U.S. again from the south, from Mexico, all the way to Nova Scotia. So it goes north, uh, south, north. Great. And that's in April, 2024. So there are opportun uh, plenty of opportunities. It goes through major cities, like in everywhere. So people can start, young people can start planning uh, yes. for April, 2024. And keep, keep yes. uh, and look to your website and contact you to see what they yes. can do to contribute. Yes. Well, we're, we're going to wish you and pray that when you, if you, when you go down on the ocean, that there won't be any clouds in the sky, yes. and that you can be able to take those pictures. <laughs> and and we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank for you. giving us your time and this fascinating conversation, and thank look you. forward to stay in touch. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, for being with us with this fascinating story and journey. Uh, please stay with us for our next episode. We will be interviewing Professor Mohammed Zaman, uh, who is a professor of biomedical engineering and wrote a book called The Biography of Resistance. It's all about antibacterial resistance. Thank you and stay well. Mm -hmm.